It is interesting to compare the prelude in C minor from book two from the prelude in C minor from book one because it does show um, how the genre evolved in Bach's mind in the uh, some 20 years which separated the two. Um, and it is particularly interesting comp to compare those two sets because they do have similarities. If you do remember the book one, listen to the beginning of the book two. So you will see that in some ways you could argue the cell is used in both sets. But where in book one it was used in a static way, in book two it's much more dynamic. can arguably, arguably be described still as a kind of exercise. Book two is a fully fledged piece of music and that is going to be a characteristic we are going to find time and time again. Interpretation. I again strongly, just like in book one, abide absolutely by the concept of the tempo ordinario. I will refer you to the talk on book one, which brings me to this kind of speed. And which seems very natural to me. However, I think you will find more easily available uh, people and certainly pianists who would play it like this. That is a very popular conception of Bach, which I personally think is somewhat alien to the spirit of Baroque music and of Bach in particular. It seems to me a very pianistic way of looking at the work, where I tend to think about Bach in a vocal way. And certainly when I play a work like this, I try to get away from the sound of the piano and imagine, in this case, typically a duet between the cello and um, oboe. And then you get a much more a quality of singing. out the melancholy of the piece which is of course totally worked out now you might argue well maybe this is not a melancholic piece of music it remains that the key of C minor has historically only been used for moods which were rather on the somber side of life and I can simply bring out a Mozart concerto number 24 This is one example among many. All the, uh, the C minor works which have been composed in the classical era have this dark undertone. And this is not a tragic piece of music, but it's not a completely an exception to that rule. The fugue has the interesting feature of being in the old, perhaps the only one in the 48 that seems to be an attempt to write what should be an improvised fugue. Now, how do we know this? Well, because it is extremely difficult to improvise a fugue in any convincing way. Fugue is the most highly sophisticated genre. And to write a good fugue take an immense amount of skill and care and deliberation. To improvise it, 
is bordering on impossible. You can do it with a lot of training, but you will have to rely on a bag of trick and uh, a good musician will be able to tell the difference between the two. What tells me, and I'm not the only one thinking this, what tells me that this is meant to show what is an improvised fugue as a sort of different genre as a written fugue, is that when you follow individual voices, they don't really make sense, which is not true in any other case. One of the beauty of playing a bar fugue is that you can isolate a voice, play it, follow it through, and it is perfectly constructed and beautiful. Here I'll play you just a little extract following the middle voice or highlighting the middle voice. I'll just put a spotlight on it. find this type of, in some ways, meaningless phrase. It's, it's too jerky, it doesn't have a logic. In a, in a really constructed written fugue, you would never have this sort of thing. So it is a prototype of an improvised fugue. It has one feature which makes it still a very attractive piece of music. Right at the moment where you think the piece is finished, there is a sort of post-scriptum, which is, changes the tone, makes it a bit more, um, well, more sad, but it's not exactly the exact word I want to use, but... Um, I'll show you. hesitant phrase. Which seems to be full of doubt and, and yes, a tinge of melancholy or even nostalgia that rounds it very beautifully uh, where it could otherwise be a fugue which is a little bit of a letdown.